Hi class, this is your instructor, Skylar Hall. Welcome back. We've now moved on to Chapter 6, The Integumentary System. As we begin this chapter, keep in mind what we'll go through here is a basic understanding of the skin and its derivatives. So, as I begin this chapter, just keep in mind that the skin does more than just protect you. The skin is here representing an approximate 7% of your body weight. And even with that, the skin also ensures that we don't fall prey to bacteria. Bacteria is all around us, and it's, of course, here to ensure that bacteria does not, of course, break that first line of defense. And even with that, the skin also serves as a reservoir for blood. So let's begin now with the chapter. And as I begin here, keep in mind that on the test, in addition to having pictures or figures, of those four basic types of tissues. What you will also have here is, well, the tissues there with a description brief, description, the function of that tissue, and then of course, the location, meaning where is it that you would find that specific type of tissue. And I'm not just referring to epithelial connective muscle and nerve tissue, I'm referring to, of course, those specific types that were reviewed. So in this chapter, what you'll be tasked with is shown to you all in figure 6.2a. And that figure, what you all will do, being shown here now, 6.2a, is label it as you see it. In addition to labeling it, you all will also provide the function of each of those, I think, 23 items. I recommend you start this early and review it often. This, of course, will make up, of course, that short answer essay, meaning the labeling and then, of course, providing the function of each of those. And on that same note, you should also pay close attention to figure 6.15. So figure 6.15 is going to be what you see as the rule of nines. We haven't quite gotten there yet, but as we do get there, it'll make a lot more sense, I know. So please make sure you take time to list, of course, those percentages. I'm not concerned with what's stated in that figure. My concern here is, is it 4.5%? Is it 18%? Is it 9%? So simply giving the percentages is all you all will do, anteriorly and or posteriorly. Then of course we'll get to burns. So I would say for the exam class you all should know every single thing that there is in your textbook about burns and I'll present that here in this chapter. So you will classify burns by being a first degree burn, a second degree burn, or even that fourth degree burn. I think I said first degree, second degree, a third degree burn, or even a fourth degree burn. And then with that, you all will, of course, describe what is a critical burn. And after that, you will then get to, of course, what is called the treatment of burns. So having done all of this, please just make sure you're taking out that time to prepare for the course. Because, I'll be blunt, if you're not taking out the time to prepare for the class, for this course, the class will seem that much more difficult. So here we are with the skin and its tissues. So the skin, as it states, is composed of several types of tissues. So as we refer to the skin, you can also refer to it as being that cutaneous membrane, if you remember from the last chapter. And of course, there are two layers that make up the skin itself. Those layers are as follows. The, of course, epidermis, superiorly, and deep to the epidermis will be, of course, the dermis. So when you have that epithelial tissue, that is what overlies what, of course, lies beneath being that connective tissue. So the epidermis that is there is composed primarily of stratified squamous cells. So those epithelial cells are that outermost protective shield of our body. And then what lies underneath is the dermis. And it makes up the bulk of the skin by and large. And as it's there, it's, it's tough. It's leathery and made primarily of dense connective tissue. So it's only that dermis that is vascular. So that does indeed mean that the epidermis class is a vascular. So that means if you've ever had that paper cut and that paper cut happened to not bleed, it was all because that paper cut did not pierce into that vascular dermal layer of the skin. So continuing here, just keep in mind the difference between each of those. So now let us begin with the epidermis. And just make sure you all take time to review about the burn technician in the career corner. 
you'll find that in your textbook class on page 179. And even there, you'll find out things that are in your test, such as, of course, the escrotomy or even class debridement, which we'll get to here in just a little bit. So here we are with what is known as the dermis and epidermis. So keep in mind that the epidermis, being that outer layer, is thin comparably, meaning compared to that thicker layer called the dermis. So the dermis that's made up of mostly those kinds of tissues also contains collagen, elastic fibers, smooth muscle, and of course nerve tissue and blood. So that basement membrane is what anchors the dermis. And by way of anchoring that dermis, it of course would be there by way of the hypodermis. So as you see here, class, on the top left-hand portion of page 180, so beneath that dermis would be the areolar as well as the adipose tissues. So as it is there, that's what binds the skin to the underlying organs. So these tissues, they are not part of the skin at all. It's only the epidermis and the dermis that make up the skin. So keep in mind that the hypodermis or subcutaneous layer is not even part of the skin itself. So keep in mind what follows beneath there would be the intradermal and intramuscular injections. So that intradermal injection is going to be administered, of course, into the skin by way of the subcutaneous injections. So it's going to be a hollow needle that goes into that subcutaneous layer beneath the skin, as opposed to what you find in that intramuscular injection. So that would be administered into the muscles themselves, and they're called hypodermal injections. So having done that, the epidermis is now here. So with the epidermis, keep in mind that it is a vascular, as, as I've said before, and composed primarily of stratified squamous epithelium. So that basement membrane that is there is what anchors those cells. So with that, I'll get into specific cells of the epidermis. So in the epidermis, the first type of cell is known as the keratinocytes. That's K-E-R-A-T-I-N-O-cytes. So what keratinocytes do is produce keratin. So it's because of those keratohyaline granules, which are within, that make it so unique. And if you're wondering what I'm getting to, it's those granules, those keratohyaline granules, that allow the skin to have its waterproof. So having mentioned that, it's those keratinocytes that are tightly connected by desmosomes. Those are types of cellular junctions. And they arise in that deepest part of the epidermal layer. And that would be by way of the stratum basal, which we haven't gotten to quite yet. So from, from this occurring, they undergo almost continuous mitosis. That's that cell division, that asexual way. And these cells are pushed upward by the production, of course, new cells. And then it's going to be keratin that dominates that cell. So that's why I say that, of course, we have those dead keratinized cells. They go through the process of keratinization. So we slough off millions of keratinocytes throughout the day. And, of course, we have a new layer of epidermis approximately every 25 to 45 days. So up next, you may also find a callus, meaning on your, I guess I'll say your foot, for example, from a shoe that may slide far too much. So that happens because, of course, the friction that's there persistently. And it's all because of the proliferation of those cells. So up next, I'll get down to what are known as the melanocytes. That's M-E-L-A-N-O-C-Y-T-E-S. Melanocytes are those spider-shaped epithelial cells, and they synthesize that pigment called melanin. So this is found in that deepest layer of the epidermis. Keep this in mind, class. This is important to know. So melanin, class, it is made, and it accumulates in the membrane-bound granules known as monosomes. So I'll say again, we have cells known as monocytes, which contain monosomes, and of course, within the monosomes is melanin. And just keep that in mind that it's that that causes skin color differences. And it's all genetic. It's, of course, not discrete characters. And I, I say this in the classes I teach face-to-face -face and I'll sit here online. Meaning you are likely taught in the biology course about discrete characters, things being this or that, such as maybe tall pea plants or short pea plants, such as a widow's peak or no widow's peak. 
Well, as I get here to the metal sites by where the metal zones, which package melanin the pigment, it's of course not discrete characters. Here, it's, it's quite different, meaning in this way, I say it's continuous variation, so it, it, would, it would never be black or white, even though a lot of times it's stated to be, okay, it's black or it's white. I'll leave it at that. And the reason, of course, the skin colors are as they are, it's all because of the activity of your lysosomes. Yes, the organelles that you all had to learn for the last test. So it's because of or due to your genes, and it's responsible to, the, of course, those lysosomes. So that means that since I'm black or African-American, it's or Afro-American, it's all because of my lysosomal activity is, of course, not as active as, of course, someone who happens not to be black or African-American or Afro-American. So I'm, I'm saying this to say that if you happen to be white, it's all because you had, of course, a lot higher lysosomal activity that, of course, destroyed the melanin because we all have the same number of monocytes. It's just the degree to which, of course, the lysosomal activity, of course, is active in our cells. I'll continue now. So with this, what happens is the melanin, the melanin granules, they accumulate. And what happens is they accumulate on the sunny side of the keratinocyte nucleus. So they shield the DNA. I say again, they shield, meaning the melanin, the melanin shields our DNA, protecting it, of course, from the damaging effects of ultraviolet radiation, meaning those UV rays in sunlight. So if, if you're going outside, which I think that many of you all are going outside, hence, of course, depending on the time of the year it is now, make sure you wear sunscreen. Even I, of course, can be found to be guilty of being outside in the summer wearing a sweatshirt to ensure, of course, that I stave off those mutations. I haven't gotten quite there yet, but it's that accumulation of mutations over time that leads to cancer. Yes, skin cancer, such as, of course, squamous cell carcinoma, or basal cell carcinoma, or, I guess I'll just go there, or melanoma, which I haven't gotten quite to yet. Up next is the dendritic cell. So dendritic cells are star-shaped cells, and I learned them a long time ago as being Langerhans cells. So that's D-E-N-D-R-I-T-I-C, dendritic cells, or Langerhans cells. That's L-A-N-G-E-R-H-A-N-S. So what these cells do is they keep us alive. They, they function class in immunity. So they ingest those foreign substances and they activate our immune response. That's all we know about those. Next up are the tactile cells or Merkel cells. So these cells class, they're present at that epidermal and dermal junction. And what they do here is they have that combination of tactile functions, meaning they're here class for sensory receptors, for touch, touch receptors. So having done that, what I'll get to nextly will be those differing layers of the epidermis. The differing epidermal layers. I'll begin now. So I'll begin at the bottom, the deepest layer. So it's called the stratum basal, the stratum basal layer, or even you may hear someone refer to it as the stratum germinativum, as I learned it. So that stratum basal layer is that deepest layer and within this layer, we have that single row of stem cells. I did say again, that single row of stem cells. These cells remain, they continually go through the process of mitosis, meaning the mitotic process. Of course, rapidly dividing. And what happens thereafter, after, is that these cells are pushed up, up, I guess I'll say up, up, and away. Up next, we have the stratum spinosum, or prickle cell layer as it's known. So these prickly cells are here. And they have these intermediate, th thick, thick filaments. And what they do here is by being scattered among the cells, among the keratinocytes, they are here in class to ensure that you don't die. I'm not saying you would die just because, of course, this cell was not or is not here. But they're here in class, ensuring, of course, to keep us alive. Up next is the stratum granulosum. So the stratum granulosum class is the place in which those keratinocytes change and begin to go through the process of keratinization, accumulating that keratohyalin granule. So as this occurs here, those granules here are what make our skin water resistant, and it's all because of the water resistant glycolipid granules, the lamellar granules inside. 
So with that, this is ensuring that everything that we come in contact with does not enter into the body itself. Up next is the stratum lucidum. So the stratum lucidum is just that thin, thin, clear layer of cells. And it's about, uh, approximately three layers. And I'll leave it at that. And the reason I leave it at that is because this layer, the stratum lucidum, is only found in thick skin. And if you're wondering, where do you find thick skin? Well, I would say it this way. Typically, class, thick skin is hairless. So you find thick skin, class, in the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. But then again, of course, the thickest skin in the body is typically, not typically, it is found, class, where your traps are, your trapezius muscles, right there at the back. That is the thickest skin you have, even though it's thin skin. So what I'm skating to is, is that thin skin does not have a stratum lucidum. That's the only part that's found, class, in thick skin. Next up is the stratum cornea, the stratum corneum, the horny layer. So the stratum corneum is where we have these, I'll say, these dead cells, meaning these cells here are a nuclei. They have no nucleus, and it's approximately 20 to 30 cell layers thick. Class, that's thick, meaning, of course, I said this, where we are, is a vascular. Well, it has to be a vascular because it has no, no supply of blood, yes, but of course, it's just so far from where that blood supply is, being there in the dermis. So, as it is here, the keratin is within the cells here, and this is what protects skin from abrasion and penetration. So, it, it's waterproof, and this class is why. So, it ensures, class, that those things that should not get within us, such as chemicals or other biological agents, and even those physical assaults, such as you getting cut on something, it does not, class, affect those cells, which are deeper and, of course, alive. These class are the layers class of the epidermis. So as I continue on class here on page 181, just keep in mind there that if those cells, of course, happen to not have a, a proper blood supply, and I'm here on the left-hand column class, page 181, if those cells die or go to, to the process of becoming necrotic or go to the process of being or having necrosis, I mean, your tissues will break down, and it may very well be due to a pressure ulcer or decubitus ulcer or a bed sore. It may appear. So in the event that you ever class have patients that you are responsible for, please make sure that this does not occur to your patient or any patient class that's there. Because if that were your loved one, I would think that you would not want him or her class to form a bed sore or a decubitus ulcer or a pressure ulcer. So they form typically class by that skin being there beneath some bony depression, such as it being class a shoulder, an elbow, a hip, or even a heel. So please turn him or her class frequently and treat that person as if they were your, I guess I'll say, your very own loved one. I'll now continue on class here with what you see class on page 182. So this is all about the melanocytes and, of course, the function of the melanin in the melanocytes. So what I'll get to nextly is skin color. So skin color is due, by and large, to what we have. And what I'm meaning is, it's largely due to melanin, or the lack of melanin. melanin. But with that, we have a different type of pigment, and this is called eumelanin. So we have eumelanin, which is that brownish black found in the epidermis. And then we also have this reddish yellow called Pheomelanin. So pheomelanin is typically, of course, what you see in those areas that may look this reddish yellow color. So I've now continued on to what you all see on page 184. So here, it's sometimes seen that someone has skin with no pigment, and that person would have the condition known class as alb albinism. And it's, of course, a genetic condition that was inherited where they have all recessive alleles. I mentioned a, a bit earlier that skin color, of course, is determined by a number of genes, meaning it's continuous variation, and I said it's not discrete characters. So that would be, of course, because of which all of those recessive alleles. Let's get on down to blood. Blood in our dermal vessels may affect skin color. And I'm saying it this way is because... Well, the blood being oxygen rich, it appears because that pigment called hemoglobin being that bright red color, and the skin may appear that bit pinkish. 
However, with low oxygenation, the hemoglobin begins to get that dark red, and then it gets to be that bluish color. And this, of course, is because of cyanosis, or, the, or because of the person has become cyanotic. And then, next of which, I'll get to the blood vessels, can affect skin color. So dilation glass may cause the redding of skin, such as I mentioned with that primary immune response, thanks a lot to our mast cells, releasing, of course, histamine. And then there are the very other side of things, I meaning on the converse is the constriction of those blood vessels may cause the skin to lose that reddish color and appear, of course, a bit pale, and likely because that person's gotten quite cold, and it does get quite cold here. And then we get on down to that orange-yellow color, and this is because of the pigment carotene. And typically, the carotene is found in the adipose. And we also have disease. So with disease comes this yellowish skin tone that indicates the person having jaundice, which is because of that liver malfunction. And many times, this is seen in newborn children. So a newborn child may become jaundice, having that yellowish skin shortly after birth, and it could be because of blood incompatibility, or just that, as I mentioned earlier, that underdeveloped, undeveloped, excuse me, that underdeveloped liver, almost a uterus. But of course, this is that inborn error of metabolism. So what happens is, this was discovered back in 1958 by way of a British hospital nurse. So in taking her tiny charges out in the sun, she noticed that a child whose skin had been a yellow pallor developed normal pigmentation when he lay in the sunlight. However, the part of the child's body covered by the diaper and therefore not exposed to the sun remained yellow. So what happened was, I did just say that, is that the sunlight enables the body to break down bilirubin, and of course that's a substance that accumulates in the skin from the liver. So a liver substance accumulating in the skin is called bilirubin. And just in case you don't know, of course, bilirubin is that reason in which your, I guess I'll say, fecal matter is brown. But that's a different, of course, lecture. So today, of course, as it happens, the yellowish skin in newborns that indicates jaundice will allow that child to just be there in the NICU likely with those billy lights for a few days with, of course, protective goggles and, of course, no clothing. It was amazing when, when my son was born, I saw that very same thing, meaning he was in the NICU because all the children at this, at this hospital go to the NICU no matter what. He was healthy. But I looked to my left, and I hear, I hear noises, and I see these lights. I said, oh, my goodness. I couldn't take a picture. I didn't even think about that picture. But, of course, these billy lights were on those children over there. I think it may have been at least one to two. If not one, it was two children over there with billy lights on. It was amazing to see, and I'll just teach about it. So from here, I'll take myself back. And get now to the dermis. And at some point, class, at some point in your studies, please make sure you all review clinical application 6.1 with tanning. I say now you should review this because many people tan. And many people tan indoor. And skin cancer is real. We'll do a little bit about skin cancer. I'll say a little bit later and even get to, of course, that A, B, C, D, E rule, that checklist for melanoma. In the meantime, I'll now continue on with what is known as the dermis. So the dermis class is made up of strong, flexible connective tissue, and its cells are typical of those found in any connective tissue proper. So there have things known there as fibroblasts, macrophages, and even some mast cells and white blood cells. So with this, the dermis has a rich supply of nerve fibers and blood vessels and even lymphatic vessels. So the major portions of hair follicles reside here, as well as oil and sweat glands, and each, of which, each of which class derive from epidermal tissue, but are within the dermis itself. Hence, I likely have said to you all, the skin and its derivatives. So the dermis class has two layers. They're known class as the papillary and reticulator, and then lie class next to each other with a distinct boundary, so it's easy to class and tell the difference between the two. So we have those epidermal ridges, and the reason those epidermal ridges exist is all because of those dermal, dermal papillae. I recommend, class, you take your time to label that diagram and to go through 
the functions of each of those very soon. So the dermal papillae, they increase the surface area where those epidermal cells receive oxygen, as well as nutrients from the, from the dermal capillaries. And those dermal papillae are also found in the skin all over the body, but are most abundant class in our hands and feet. So from which class we have this neutral variation, meaning this doesn't, I guess I'll say, give you any more or any less class fitness. I'm referring to evolution here. But what I mean is, is this pattern that's impressed upon those fingers class is making your and my class in the print. They're all unique class. And I mentioned earlier, this is neutral variation. So the genes class determine the fingerprint patterns. So it happens class as you were a fetus and I, as I was a fetus and of course we just pressed of course those ridges against the uterus. So amazing. So no two fetuses class share fingerprints that are exactly alike. Even class in identical twins. So the dermis class binds the epidermis to those underlying tissues. And let's get to the papillary layer a bit quicker. So it has areola connective tissue, and with that it has its talic it has fibers, excuse me, class that form loosely woven mat with small blood vessels, and it's a bit loose by way of those phagocytes that are there, that are there patrolling class for bacteria that may of course get into our skin. Up next class, I'll get on down to we did this already. I'll continue on class to tactile corpuscles or Mesner's corpuscles. So we have those touch receptors called tactile or Mesner, Mesner's corpuscles. And we also have free nerve endings, which are their class for pain. And along the same note, I'll move now class to our reticular layer. So with the reticular layer, it makes up class, I say, most of the dermis, meaning an approximate 80% of the dermis class is reticular layer. So it's coarse and has an amazing network class of blood vessels that nourish this layer, as well as that cutaneous plexus. So with this, I'll continue on here. So now class on page 185, in which you will get a number of functions class for that skin diagram, which you're responsible for. So the dermis contains muscle fibers and some regions, of course, such as the skin that encodes the testis, called the scrotum, it has class many smooth muscle cells that can wrinkle the skin when they contract. So other smooth muscle in the dermis class is associated with accessory structures such as our hair follicles. So many muscle fibers are anchored to the dermis in the skin of our face. So they help class produce those voluntary muscle movements associated with your facial expressions. So the dermal blood vessels, they supply nutrients class to all skin cells. And those vessels class also help regulate body temperature. Our nerve cell processes, which are scattered class throughout the dermis. And then we, of course, I'll say again, we have nerve cell processes that are scattered class throughout the dermis. I'll begin firstly. The motor nerve cell process. It conducts class impulses. I say again, the motor nerve cell process. This is on page 185 class, left hand column. Second full stanza. The motor nerve cell process. It conducts impulses class out of the brain or spinal cord to your dermal muscles and glands. That's highly important to know. The sensory nerve cell process. Notice the class. I said sensory, not motor. So now I'm at the sensory nerve cell process, and it conducts class impulses away, away. It conducts impulses class away from specialized sensory receptors in the skin into class, the brain and spinal cord. If I were y'all class, I'll write that down and make sure we understand that. Motor nerve cell process class from brain to dermal muscle or gland. Sensory nerve cell process class from a specialized sensory receptor class to the brain or spinal cord. I hope you have it. If you don't, just let me know. So the dermis class also contains different types of sensory receptors, one of which class being the lamellar or the lamellated pancreas corpuscles. They respond class to pressure. 
In the upper dermis, we have tactile or mesonous corpuscles, which sense light touch and text texture. That's the second time I've done those. And then, of course, we have free nerve endings class, which respond to temperature changes and factors that can damage skin, i.e. glass, pain receptors. It keeps you alive. So the dermis class also contains other accessory structures class, such as hair follicles, sebaceous glands, which are oil glands class, and sweat glands. Let us begin now class with accessory structures of the skin. So here class, these accessory structures of the skin These accessory structures class of the skin, they originate class from the epidermis, and things that are included here class are the nails, our hair follicles, and skin glands. So as long as those necessary structures class stay intact, meaning aren't severely burned or injured, the dermis class can definitely regenerate. Let us now begin with nails. They are a protective covering class at the ends of your fingers and toes. So each of our nails class contains a nail plate, which of course overlies the surface of the skin, called the nail bed. And then we have that whitish, thickened, half moon shaped region, known as class the lunula, the lunula. And then at the base of the nail plate is that most active region of growth. So the epithelial cells here divide class and formed newly formed cells that become keratinized. And just keep in mind that this is a different type of keratin class here. This is hard keratin as opposed to that soft keratin class that are referred to by way of the keratinization process in the skin itself. So this gives rise class tiny keratin, keratinized scales that become part of the nail plate pushing forward over that nail bed. So the keratin class, as I just mentioned, of nails is stronger class than that of the stratum corneum. I'll continue on. The hair follicle. So hair class is present on all skin surfaces except what? The palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. And I'll add to that list class from earlier, i.e. class, thick skin there. I add to class, lips, nipples, and some parts class of the external re reproductive organs. And one thing to say about the hair is that in, in some people class, forehead hair is very fine. So what happens class with hair? And this is on page 186. Is that, of course, it cycles through phases of active growth and, of course, being inactive. So at any time, 90% class of hair is in the growth phase, and each hair is a tube-like depression at the base called the hair follicle. So the stem cells class originate here at the bottom of that hair follicle. And then we have that hair bulge. So the follicle also contains what is known as the hair root. So the deepest portion class of the hair root is called the hair bulb. Keep in mind class, I cannot ask you every bit of this on the lecture test. Most of this class will be reviewed by way of the lab. So next up class is the hair papilla. And keep in mind, even though they won't be there, if it's on your chart, on your, excuse me, your figure, figure 6.2a, you have to know class what it is as well as its, its function. So the hair bulb. So next up, it's, I say it's composed of epithelial cells that are nourished from dermal blood vessels in a projection of connective tissue called the hair papilla. So as those epithelial cells divide and grow, they push older cells toward the surface. And then those cells move up toward and away from that nutrient supply become keratinized glass, and die. And that's all your hair is. Dead keratinized cells. So their remains constitute glass, the structure of the developing hair shaft. So I, I sometimes class mention that if anyone class commits a crime, just make sure you know that you will be found. If you're wondering why do I say that, it's because someone who is healthy, like you all of course, and myself, we lose class approximately 20 to 100 hairs a day. And that's just part of class, that normal cycle of hair growth. Not to mention class, the cells that we lose too. I didn't necessarily tell you because I, I, I don't want to attempt to give you class everything. But throughout the day class, we lose a number of skin cells. And when I say a number of skin cells class, it's a particularly large number of skin cells. In other words, I'll put it this way. Class, we shed 
millions of dead keratinocytes. Skin cells a day. Millions. So evidence class is left behind. Containing, of course, enough information about you and about me. So Harris class, they typically grow for approximately two to six years, and they and then of course it does not grow for two to three months, anchored in this follicle. The after class is pushed outward and drops off. So if Harris class share from the scalp are not replaced, baldness results. I know about baldness. Male pattern baldness, meaning and the next, of course, is genes. Genes class will determine hair color, and they direct the type and amount of pigment class that the epidermal monocytes produce. So dark hair class has more of that brownish-black U melanin, whereas blonde hair and red hair have more of that reddish-yellow feel melanin class. And, of course, white hair typically just has air within it class, meaning it's the air space, and that's why the hair looks, of course, that white to gray. And it appears gray. So bundles of smooth muscle cells class form the erectopilly muscle. So this is attached this class to each hair follicle. And when that muscle contracts class, that short hair in the follicle stands on end. So emotionally upset people class, or even those who are very cold, or even class nervous stimulation class, can cause that erectopilly muscle class to contract, producing goosebumps or goose flesh, which I have never heard of class when I read this textbook. So each hair follicle class is also associated class with one or more sebaceous glands or oil producing glands. And this class is where it gets quite amazing. So um, I'm taking a break for just a moment. It's not that I'm tired. <laughs> but this break I'm taking class is to make sure you all take time to review in your text class at some point. Make sure you all review redness or arrhythmia, excuse me, redness class or arrhythmia. And I'm saying that reddened skin from embarrassment class, blushing from fever, hypertension or inflammation or allergy. The very same way class, pale skin or pallor or even blanching may occur during fear, anger or even emotional stress. And you might just look pale. The very same way class, it also could signal class low blood pressure or hypotension or even class anemia. I've already done jaundice class because of the, bowel, the yellow bowel pigments in the blood. Thanks a lot for having, of course, the liver that is not appropriately class functioning. And then bronzing class could occur. And meaning that bronzing is that almost metallic appearance in the skin, which is a sign class of Addison's disease. You'll learn more about this class in anatomy too. And this is which class that adrenal cortex produces inadequate amounts class of steroid hormones. And it's a sign class or it could very well be a sign class, of a pituitary gland tumor that inappropriately secretes class the monocyte formating hormone. And we did have a president a present once class that had Addison's disease. It was just kept, of course, under wraps. Do you know that president? Have you heard of that president? Next of which class will be the black and blue marks or bruising. So this occurs class. And they will re re reveal class where blood escaped from the circulation and they clot it beneath the skin. So such so clotted masses class are called hematomas or blood swelling. So just make sure class you all keep in mind that if ever class he or she is hitting you, you all should leave. Domestic violence class is not the right thing. It is not the right thing. And now class, I'll continue on. So here, I'll begin things with glands. So we're beginning class here with what are known as sebaceous glands. So sebaceous glands, they contain, of course, groups of specialized epithelial cells, and they're usually associated class with hair follicles. Sebaceous glands class are holocrine glands. I repeat, sebaceous glands class are holocrine glands, or oil glands. If you want to call them oil glands, call them oil glands. So with this class, they secrete class or produce globules of fatty material that accumulate, and then of course the swelling and the bursting cells. So the result of this fatty material and cellular debris class is called sebum. So when you think of sebaceous glands or oil glands, think of their product class being sebum. And yes, I did just say class. Sebaceous glands secrete a product. I did not say excrete a waste. They secrete class a product. 
So with this, I said there are found glass all over the body, sebaceous glands are, except glass on thick skin of the palms and soles. Can you tell me why that would be the case? If you said because thick skin glass is hairless skin, you're correct because sebaceous glands or oil glands glass are always associated glass with a hair follicle. Keep it in mind. So the sebum glass is created into hair follicles through short ducts and helps keep the hair's glass soft and pliable. And even glass waterproof. But the very same way glass acne does result from excess sebum secretion. So the sebaceous glands glass are scattered throughout the skin, but of course, keep in mind they are there are none glass on the palms and soles. So that it's in hairy areas glass, with an exception, meaning in some regions glass such as the lips, the corners of the mouth, and parts glass of the external rooted organs, sebaceous glands open directly glass to the skin surface, rather than having that association class with a hair follicle. So up next class we will be at Sweat glands. So sweat glands, or sudoriferous glands, are widespread throughout the skin, and each of these glands are consisting of that tiny tube that, of course, looks to be that ball or coil in the deep dermis. So the coiled portion of the gland is closed in its deep end and is lined with sweat secreting epithelial cells. So the most, the most numerous type of sweat gland, excuse me here, the most numerous type of sweat gland class is that Merroquin sweat gland. I'll say again, the most numerous type of sweat gland class is the Merroquin sweat gland. So let's continue here. And you could also call the Merroquin sweat gland class an Eccrine sweat gland. So with this, they respond class, I say, throughout life, to changes class in body temperature. And I say particularly class to elevated body temperature. That's the function class. Write it down, please. So with that class, by way of environmental heat, which we know what environmental heat is now, today, since I'm recording this video, it was approximately 92 degrees Fahrenheit. Walk outdoors here in the south, and of course, it will activate class, your eccrine sweat glands. And of course, they also respond class to physical exercise. So when I began to run, yes, my sweat glands became active. To ensure class, that they bring my body temperature class back down to, of course, homeostasis. Is that positive feedback or negative feedback? Most definitely class is, is keeping me alive. Negative feedback. So, eccrine sweat glands, or American sweat glands class, are abundant on the forehead, neck, and back, where they produce glass, profuse sweat on hot days, or during intense physical activity. And they also release glass, the moisture that appears on the palms and soles when a person becomes emotionally stressed. So, a tube or duct that opens at the surface as a pore carries sweat that the American or eccrine sweat glands secrete. Sweat class is mostly water. However, it contains class small amounts of salts and, number two, wastes such as urea and uric acid. Thus, sweating class is also an excretory function. Now, why would I say class? Well, why would your textbook state that? This is on page 188 class, top right-hand corner. Why would your textbook class say that sweating is also class an excretory function? It is most definitely class because of the presence class of urea and uric acid, those metabolic wastes. We must get rid of those class. So other glands class are known as apocrine sweat glands. So as I get to these apocrine sweat glands class, these glands, they do not become active class until a person has become, of course, one who reached puberty. So upon reaching puberty class, largely these are largely confined class to the axillary and and no genital areas. So with this class, they secrete by exocytosis. So the apocrine sweat glands can wet certain areas of the skin when, the body, when a person has become emotionally upset, frightened, or even in pain. So they're also active class during sexual arousal. 
So these African sweat glands are most numerous in the groin and acid axillary regions, and the ducts of these sweat glands are open into hair follicles. So the secretion slash of these include proteins and lipids that produce body odor when metabolized by skin bacteria. I say again, when metabolized by skin bacteria, the proteins and lipids, which are here, are going to be, of course, causing the smell. So some sweat glands are structurally and functionally modified to secrete specific fluids, such as modified sweat glands. And they include class, the serumous glands, which secrete serumen, called earwax, and even class, the mammary glands, which, of course, secrete milk. So there you have it. Keep those in mind, class. Keep those in mind. Please review class clinical application 6.3 at some point. This is about acne. And I can guarantee you, class, nothing on this page mentions anything about acne class being caused by chocolate. Not at all. I'll now get to class functions of the skin. So skin functions class, they're quite numerous. And even though they're quite numerous, they're amazingly class important. So your textbook class begins saying that it's one of the most versatile organs in the body, being vital class in maintaining homeostasis, being a protective covering, preventing harmful substances from entering, as well as disease causing microorganisms or pathogens. And it also class retards water loss and houses class sensory receptors and even containing class epidermidendritic cells, known as Langerhans cells, which keep us alive, class. So skin, class, is majorly important because what it does for us, class, is it produces that vitamin D precursor called dehydrocholesterol, which produces class vitamin, of course, D, by way of class the sun, meaning as soon as your skin, class, is exposed to sunlight, we, class, then, of course, changes that into that inactive form of vitamin D. So in the liver class and, and kidneys, this inactive form is then modified and becomes class calcitriol, which of course is vitamin D. So the skin class is quite important. And let me go through this class, I won't say really quickly class, but I'll take my time here and not go too slowly. All right, so as it occurs, the skin class has a number of functions. One of those functions class being, of course, protective, which I think you all know about pretty well. So I won't spend much time there with the protective function. It also class functions as a chemical barrier. And, excuse me for not changing. That chemical barrier that I'm referring to class being those secretions and even class melanin. So we have an acid mantle, meaning that low pH of our skin secretions ensures class that it retards bacterial growth. Also within the skin class is what is known as dermicidin in, in our sweat. And a bacterial cytosol substances class within sebum kills many bacteria. So our skin cells also produce natural antibiotics called defensins, which really literally class punch holes in bacteria, making them look like sieves. So wounded skin also releases class large quantities of protective peptides called calthocidins, and these are particularly effective class in preventing infection by group A, streptococcus bacteria. And they thought skin was boring, whoever they are. <laughs> and then thereafter, let's get to physical barriers. I won't be here long. So the physical barriers class, of course, will be the skin and the hardness class of those keratinized cells as that physical barrier. Well, the very same way class, the skin also is not quite effective against some things. Things that do penetrate the skin in limited amounts include lipid-soluble substances such as, of course, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and fat-soluble vitamins such as vitamin A, D, E, and K, and even class steroids such as the estrogens. So also these things are known as oleoresins of certain plants such as poison ivy and poison oak. Enters light on in. Organic solvents class such as acetone, dry cleaning fluid, and even class paint thinner. And it, it does it by way of dissolving class, our, our cells lipids. It enters right in. And then thereafter, I'll also this list class, salts of heavy metals are able class to, of course, go right in, such as lead and mercury. Please watch out for those class. Those can kill us. And then selected, selected drugs, such as, of course, nitroglycerin. 
Even drug agents' glass, such as those penetration enhancers, can allow glass drug to be carried right into the skin. So the biological barrier class of skin, of course, is there by way of the macrophages class and the DNA itself. And you're saying the DNA? Yes, meaning although that melanin class provides a fairly good chemical sunscreen, our DNA class is actually a remarkably effective biologically based sunscreen. So electrons in DNA absorb class UV radiation. But of course, glass, the DNA converts that potentially destructive radiation into harmless heat. And it's all because, of course, they heat up and vibrate. Our skin class functions in body temperature regulation, which I know you all know a lot about. Thanks a lot, homeostasis. And then we have cutaneous sensation class by our cutaneous sensory receptors. We have those that are called exteroceptors class, and those exteroceptors are, of course, responding to stimuli class that arise outside of the body by way of our mesmer's corpuscles. And I already touched on class our metabolic functions. I'll be here briefly. So our skin class is a chemical factor, and it's fueled in part by the sun's rays. As I mentioned earlier, the sun class bombards our skin. We have this modified cholesterol molecule and it's converted glass into vitamin, that vitamin D precursor that's transported glass via the blood to other body areas glass to be converted into vitamin D, which plays glass. I repeat, this is why vitamin D is so important. So vitamin D class is so important because, of course, it plays a role class in calcium metabolism, i.e. calcium class cannot, or I say again, calcium cannot be absorbed class from the digestive tract without vitamin D. Write that down, class, and, re and remember that because it's going to be majorly important class here soon. And other functions class include, of course, the chemical con conversions class that su supplement those of the liver, meaning the keratinite enzymes, can disarm many cancer-causing chemicals that pen penetrate class epidermis. I said earlier, class, at the beginning of the chapter, that skin, the skin serves as a blood reservoir it contains class in approximate 5% class of our entire blood volume so that it can class shunt blood class. I repeat, it can then shunt blood class to, of course, those body organs such as the muscles or others of which that need it. Then lastly, we get to, of course, its excretory function. And here, class, it eliminates limited amounts class of nitrogen-containing wastes. I mentioned these earlier class being, of course, urea, uric acid, and ammonia by way of sweat. And I did say class, excretory functions. So although most wastes are excreted class in the urine, profuse sweating is an important avenue class for water and salt loss. And that's referring to class sodium chloride. But keep in mind, you all should review class both hyperthermia, that abnormally class high body temperature, which can be fatal potentially, as well as class hypothermia, which could also class be potentially fatal. Review those class on your own. You found those class on the bottom right hand side class of page 190. Please also review clinical application class 6.4. And this here class lets you all know about the fever. So it's pyrogens that cause, of course, that fever. And, and what I'm referring to class is the fever is nothing more than that special case of, of hypothermia in which that set point class has changed to not being class at approximately 98.5 degrees or 98.6 degrees. That set point class has been, of course, changed. It's been elevated. Keep that in mind, class, that you'll find that application of the clinic, 6.4 class, on page 192. So I'll now, class, get to what is known as inflammation. And, of course, wounds and burns. So as I'm here, class, the healing of wounds and burns by way of inflammation, it's, it's nothing more than that normal response class to injury or stress inflammation is. So the blood vessels in the infected tissues that dilate become more permeable class, allowing those fluids to leak into damaged tissues, and inflamed skin class becomes reddened, swollen, warm, and even class painful to touch. However, class, those dilated blood vessels provide class of tissues with more nutrients and oxygen, which aids class in healing. So if a cut class happens to occur, that break in that first line of defense, a shallow cut class that only affects the epidermis, of course, doesn't bleed. It heals quite quickly. Deeper cuts, however, 
these, of course, causes the break in a blood vessel and the release of blood. And of course, that blood forms a clot in the womb. So that clot consists class mainly of a fibrous protein called fibrin. But keep in mind, class, I said that clot consists mainly of a fibrous protein class called fibrin. Before class that cut, before that break in that blood vessel, fibrin class was in its inactive form, and it was called fibrinogen. So once class, fibrinogen, fibrinogen class, was changed into its active form class called fibrin, it formed that clot that, of course, keeps you and me alive if ever class does a break in the blood vessel. So this forms class that, that other protein in the plasma, the, the blood cells, and the platelets that get trapped class the protein fibers. That, I say again, fibrous protein. So the tissue fluid class seeps into the area and dry, the area and dry, and then the blood clot and the dry tissue class forms a scab. So those epithelial tissues class begin to proliferate, proliferate beneath the scab, bridging class the wound, before those fibroblasts migrate into the area and begin to secrete class collagen fibers. So, so with that, of course, they bind class to the edges of the wound, begin class, of course, the process of forming the scar class thereafter. And this is, or these are class cuts. So having done that, I want to go back just a moment, class, to the clinical application called 6.1. The left-hand column class on page 183 is where I am. So what happens here, class, is that one in five Americans will develop skin cancer at some point. Most tumors class that arise in the skin are benign and do not spread, meaning they do not metastasize to those other areas. However, class, some skin tumors are malignant or cancerous and they invade, class, other body areas. So the single most important risk factor for skin cancer class is overexposure. I argue it's overexposure to ultraviolet radiation and sunlight, which class damages DNA bases i.e. class that causes mutations. So adjacent class, permitting bases, often respond by fusing and forming lesions called dimers. So that UV radiation class also appears to disable a tumor suppression gene. That class is TP53. That is a gene responsible. You should remember that class from a prior lecture. So in a limited number of cases class, frequent irritation by skin infections, chemicals, or even physical trauma class might be that predisposing factor. Interest in the class, sunburned skin accelerates its production of the FAST, a protein that causes genetically damaged skin class to commit suicide and, of course, reduce the risk of mutations, which causes sun link skin cancer. So, this is why, class, the skin begins to peel after, of course, a burn in the sun called a sunburn. So with that, I'll continue on with skin cancer. So there's no such thing. I repeat class, the text states there is no such thing. There is no such thing as a healthy tan. Yes, I say that a lot of times. Tanning class is not healthy. But the good news is class is the newly developed skin lotions can fix damaged DNA before the involved cells become cancerous. Keep in mind, class, that there's just no healthy tan that exists. So there are three major forms, class, of skin cancer, and they are, class, basal cell carcinoma, squamous, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. In 80% of the cases, class, basal cell carcinoma can, of course, class, be excised, meaning a full, a full cure, class, by surgical excision, is, of course, the rule in 99% of cases, meaning it's the most common type, accounting for an approximate class 80% class of skin cancer cases. Squamous cell carcinoma is, a, is the second most common form of skin cancer, and this arises class from the keratinocytes and the stratum spinosum layer. So these appear as lesions, that scaly red and papule, or that small rounded elevation, and arises class most often on the head, meaning your scalp, your ears, and even that lower lip in the hands. They can grow, meaning it can grow class very rapidly and metastasize if not removed. 
A complete cure class is, is, of course, available and can occur if found early. The early class is melanoma. This is class cancer of those melanocytes. It's the most dangerous. I repeat, melanoma class is the most dangerous form of skin cancer, and it's because it's so metastatic class, highly met metastatic and resistant class to chemotherapy. It only accounts for that 2-3% class of skin cancers, but the incidence class is definitely increasing by 3-8% to 8 class each year. So melanoma class can begin wherever there is pigment. So it likely will appear class to be a brown to black patch that metastasizes class rapidly to the surrounding lymph and blood vessels. It spreads class. The key here class is early detection. So to help you with such, Let's get to this now. The American Cancer Society class suggests we regularly examine our skin for new moles or pigment spots by the ABCDE rule, A class for asymmetry. Look at the two sides of that pigmented spot or mole. If they do not match, that's asymmetrical. B is for border irregularity. B is for border irregularity. The borders class of that lesion, if they happen to it, Exhibit indentations, that's an irregularity. Next class is color. So the color class of that pigmented spot contains several colors, meaning blacks, browns, tans, and sometimes blues and reds. D is in dog class, is diameter. Class the diameter, I mean that spot. If it's larger class than six millimeters in diameter, meaning the size of a pencil eraser, please get it checked out. And of course, E class is for evolving. Is it changing? So from your class, on to burns. Class, this is what makes up that second part of your essay. I repeat, the second part of your essay. Burns are a devastating threat class to the body, primarily because of the effects class on the skin. So a burn is tissue damage class inflicted by intense heat, electricity, radiation, or certain chemicals, and all of which class, they denature the cell's proteins, and they kill cells in the affected areas. So the reason class, please write this down, why it's so, I guess I'll say, serious is because the immediate threat to life class resulting from a severe burn is that catastrophic loss of those bodily fluids that contain those proteins and electrolytes. I repeat, proteins and electrolytes. Class, this goes back to basic chemistry from chapter two. So I'm saying, class, this will lead to dehydration and the electrolyte imbalance, and then class, renal failure, meaning your kidneys are shut down, circulatory shock because of inadequate class of blood circulation due to that reduced blood volume. And of course, to say that patient class, those lost fluids must be replaced immediately via class NIV, meaning via intravenous fluids. So let's get to evaluating class burns. I say this because the figure class is here, figure 6.15. In adults class, the volume of fluid loss can be estimated class by computing the percentage of the body burned using what is known class as the rule of nines. So it divides the body class into 11 areas, each of which accounting class for 9% of the total body area, plus an additional class area surrounding class the genitals that account for 1% of the body surface area. This is done, class, and rule of nines is only an approximate so that those special tables are used when greater accuracy is desired. So make sure, class, as I said earlier, you can write these numbers, or at least give me these numbers, class, on the body, anteriorly, class, and posteriorly. So it's not, I'm not going to ask for anterior head and neck. Just write the number down, class, 4.5%, and so on and so forth, so, and so on and so forth, excuse me. So get back to where I was, class. Let's begin with burns. So a first degree burn glass is classified by, of course, only damaging the epidermis. There is localized redness, swelling, and pain. And this is typical class of a first degree burn. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this is a typical class of a sunburn, meaning a sunburn class is, is typified by being a first degree burn. And it heals class within an approximate two to three days. First degree burns class are partial thickness burns. Next subclass is that secondary burn. So a secondary burn class damages both the epidermis 
and upper region class of the dermis. So Ehlinger's here class are similar to that first we burn, but included here class are blisters. Blisters appear now, meaning that edema, the fluid class, goes to this area because the cell membranes are damaged. This class, the second burn, is painful. I had one once. I was cooking, I was cooking grits one summer before class, and this is I had a class in Farrell. It was an anatomy two class. I remember it like it was yesterday. Just cooking grits. It wasn't covered up. Pop, 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 pop. Bam! Hit me right there, class. My right wrist. I was okay. By the time I made it to Fairhope, I had class a blister that was there. In the meantime, class for treatment, of course, it takes a, approximate class three to four weeks, and that class, if an infection class, has been prevented. And again, class, this is a partial thickness burn. The next up class is that third degree burn. So a third degree burn class is known as a full thickness burn because it burns class the entire thickness of the skin. So the skin appears glass, blackened, gray, white, cherry red even. And initially class, there is little to no edema. This burn class is painless, and it's painless because the nerve endings class are destroyed. So it's treated class by way of what is called skin grafts. Typically by skin grafts, because it would take just class way too long for it to heal class without, of course, the help of the grafted skin. As you're seeing here, class, you're seeing, of course, a bit of a second and third degree burn. Post burn one day, three days, ten days, and of course, 176 days. Critical burns, class. If, in fact, a person has more than 25% of their body with a secondary burn, that burn class is critical. They're being a burn unit. And the same class is the case if a person class has 30 burns on more than 10% of their body. Quite critical class. The burn unit in the person's future. And then, of course, if the person has a thirdary burn class of the face, hand, or feet, that is most definitely class A critical burn. So having done that class, I'll now go on further to treatment class. So to treat a burn class, what happens now in this case is that patients with cirrhosis of burns needs need thousands of extra food calories daily class to replace those lost proteins and allow tissue repair. I said again, thousands of extra calories. So no one class can eat enough food to provide those extra calories. So burn patients are given those supplementary nutrients through gastric tubes and IV lines, replacing class both the lost fluid by IV hydration. So I say again, they get not one of those extra calories, but they also class get that replacement fluid class by IV hydration. So after the initial crisis class has passed, meaning the person has come in, the he or she class has arrived, debridement class must occur. Meaning you must remove class that burns skin to prevent class infection. And, and, and I'm saying, yes, to prevent infection and even class the threat of sepsis. I don't know if you all have heard of sepsis, that widespread bacterial infection. But sepsis class is A, majorly expensive class in hospitals. And B class, it's a potential killer class of that person. There is now class, an algorithm that's used class by hospitals all over this country that if a person has X, Y, and Z, not only X, Y, and Z, but if a person exhibits this, that, and that too, the person class goes into, of course, that sepsis pre prevention protocol to ensure not only that person doesn't die, but also class, save the hospital class, a lot of money. So having gotten this far, just make sure the burn skin class, it has to be sterile for approximately 24 hours. And thereafter class, the bacteria will then try to invade those areas class where, of course, that barrier, that skin class has been destroyed. So with that, of course, the person's wound then has to be treated and cleaned. So as I mentioned earlier class, skin grafting occurs, and it can occur class by way of being an autograft, meaning the skin class from that same individual can be transplanted, or very well, it could very well be class an allograft, being, of course, someone else's skin class being used to be grafted on class to him or her. So having done this class, I would say, I hope that you all study. And I, I say that I hope you all study class because you all have been provided class, everything you all should know. And I almost forgot class about antibiotics with, of course, 
meaning prevention of infection and fluid loss. But in the meantime, just make sure your class you all study quite well, meaning this has been Chapter 6 class. And if there are any questions, please let me know if there are any questions. But I can't stress enough, class, please study. And let me know how I can, of course, assist you all. Please make sure you study very well. And if you need me class, let me know. Thank you all for listening. And, of course, prepare well for the test.